And so, I mean, how are you going about finding companies to invest in now? I mean, is it people with domain expertise in farming? Is it people who are software engineers who have proven themselves in a way you know? And That's a good question. I, you find them? I wish there were more software opportunities in food and agriculture, since that would be a more comfortable <laughs> realm for me. Um, but there aren't. I mean, there is one that I've invested in called Farmigo, which mm -hmm. is a CSA software for helping farms sell directly to their consumers. Um, but you know, I think the really big shifts in agriculture have to do more with changing the underlying way that um, food is being produced. Mm -hmm. um, so less, less frequently directly software related. So one company I've invested in is called Bright Farms, and it's focused on colder regions, like you know, in the U.S., like New York, Philadelphia, East Coast, basically, where there's a long cold winter. Where today, if you buy a tomato or lettuce from the supermarket more than half of your money is spent on the uh, transportation from Mexico or California where the plant is grown. And um, you know these plants are picked and then transported in a refrigerated truck across the country. And so Bright Farms is instead building um, greenhouses on the roof of the supermarket mm -hmm. <laughs> where they can grow the plants upstairs and then instead of having to ship them 3,000 miles, just sell them downstairs. Um, that case, I didn't have much to go on. I mean, it's a, obviously the idea sounds really cool, so mm -hmm. you know that attracted me. Um, but I spent a lot of time um, with the founder, getting to know him. I did ref checks on the founder. Um, in this particular case, he had been running a software company before, so I could actually assess him a bit more, <laughs> I suppose, from that background. Um, but a company I'm uh, a company I'm just now investing in. Um, it's still closing its first round. Is a sustainable fertilizer company and it has really nothing to do with software. It's a, it's a company um, with a very ambitious goal of disrupting the um, $20 billion U.S. fertilizer market uh, with a compost-based alternative. Um, and um, in this particular case, I have spent now months and months with the founder and gotten to know him and really respect him and done a lot of ref checks on him and his, his partner. Uh, but it's definitely a leap of faith and part of it is just in terms of assessing the people, it's you know intuitive sense from from having done it long enough in different domains that mm -hmm. you know you can kind of pattern match of whether somebody's uh, you know talented or not. Great. Um, before I open it up to questions, do you have any uh, sort of like you know now that you've been a long time investor, any sort of mistakes you want to share, like things you learned? Yeah. Um, you well, know, over time that way. So as far as I mean, for people in the room who are entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs, um, I think, well, I'll, I'll disclaim this by saying it's more easily said than done, but my biggest mistakes um, when I was running my own companies, I would say generally came down to being afraid of taking big risks, meaning we were perhaps doing something, we suddenly felt like, oh my gosh, this might not work, and um, should we have a plan B? so that we have a safety net. If this doesn't work, this other thing would work. And um, in business school, this is, you know, this is called diversification. And um, I think, I've never been to business school, but I believe you're taught in business school that, um, <laughs> from what I understand, you're encouraged to have multiple revenue streams. And I even know, you know there's a lot of investors who will ask a company, well, what, what do you plan your revenue streams to be? My personal view is, for a startup, you should have only one revenue stream, only one product, only one brand, and put all your eggs in one basket. And um, this is uh, counterintuitive because we've all, you know, we've been told from you know early life that don't put all your eggs in the same basket. But think about it: how many eggs would you need to have before you really need two baskets? I mean, the whole story about eggs and baskets. You know, <laughs> if you're a startup, you don't have hundreds of eggs. You only have, you know, very little stuff. The story with, <laughs> with eggs and baskets is for somebody who's carrying like 100 eggs, then you need two baskets so that if you lose 50, you can keep the other 50. So if you're a big corporation, by all means, diversify. And if you're a VC, then you invest in 10 or 20 startups. But if you're the startup, you don't have hundreds of eggs. You have very limited resources, and um, I think it's, you know, for you to succeed, you almost have to put all your eggs in one basket, because if you don't, somebody else will, and they will out-execute you. 
and this is, like I said, much more easily said than done, but my own startups, both of them, um, I think were slowed down because we were basically too scared to put all our eggs in one basket. Uh, we, we tried to do multiple things at the same time and that, um, that caused us to um, both confuse our own employees and also to confuse the marketplace as to you know, not knowing exactly what we were about. Um, so my main piece of advice to entrepreneurs is um, base, you know, focus and put all your eggs in one basket. And it doesn't matter, you know, obviously you should do something that you believe in, um, but fear of failure should not prevent you from taking a risk. Um, obviously failure is not good, and um, that's why people are afraid of it, and that's why people try want to diversify, because they don't want to fail. Um, but I would say it's much better to fail quickly than to put off failure and kind of uh, you know slowly fade into oblivion. That's essentially my second company. I like gradually faded into oblivion because we diversified so much, we put off the failure. Um, you know, we eventually managed to sell the company for a small amount. But I would, in in hindsight, it would be much better if we had just had one big failure and saved three years of our lives. Um, because you can diversify over time. You mm -hmm. know, if, if your first thing fails, you start the next thing. And in three years, you can get a lot more done than if you survive, but, you know, but don't succeed. So, Great. And with that, we have time for a couple questions. If uh, I think we have a mic going around, a couple mics. So just raise your hands, and they can come over. Uh, back here. Hello, uh, this is Luis from Mexico. I would like to know if you should uh, decide or take a decision for investing in a project based on one single thing, what this thing could be. Well, um, that's easy. It's based on the caliber of the uh, entrepreneur. Um, I've had uh, more than one case where um, I've invested in something solely based on the person without really knowing anything about what their business idea was. Um, I've also had cases where I loved the idea and I had doubts about the person, but I loved the idea so much that I invested in it and it turned out to be a you know, bad investment. Um, so, uh, so for me, the, the single most important criterion is the caliber of the entrepreneur. Um, the, the example I, I was thinking of was uh, there was a guy named Dan Yates who I had um, I had known since he was a student in, at Harvard because he kept calling me from college asking for me to be his advisor. And I kept ignoring him. And then eventually he moved out to Silicon Valley and kept trying to get in touch with me and I kept ignoring him. And then he started a company and wanted me to be an advisor and I was not interested. Then that company failed and he was starting a new one. And um, at this point, finally, I was like, fine, I'll meet with you and find out what, you're, you know, what it is, your new company. The new company was interesting, and I invested in it. It did fairly well. Um, I think um, it was called EduSoft, and um, it was, uh, you know, this was 2001 when they launched their products, and by 2004 or so, they had sold a company, and I made something like five or six times return on investment, which I was very happy with. But more importantly, I realized over this, over the, those few key years, I grew to really love Dan and really respect him, and. He was essentially one of my favorite entrepreneurs. So when he was starting his next company, um, he wanted you know, to pitch me on investing. I wrote him a blank check. I really said, you know, once you have the company name, fill it in here. I didn't, I didn't know the terms. I didn't know anything about it. It was going to be in green energy, a space which I have no experience in. Um, and um, basically, I said, I'm betting on you. That company is now called Opower. Um, it's uh, arguably one of the most successful companies in the green energy space. Um, and it's worth, I think, over a billion dollars today. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, I might say I'm completely lucky, but I'd say I'd much rather bet on Dan, whatever he does next, without knowing what it is that he's doing, than to um, bet on something that's a great idea without knowing who the people are in it. Great, and I, that's unfortunately, I think, all the time we have for. So uh, thank you ever, very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, man. Yeah, that was